Okay, welcome to the last session of the day. I guess, yes, yes. Uh, so uh, Chris Lamb will be presenting on the reproducible builds status update. Thank you very much. Welcome him, please. Hi. Um, welcome to the talk. Um, unfortunately, Holger is ill, and so he won't be able to um, be speaking with me today. Um, so, yeah. The other thing I want to say straight up is this not just me. Um, the, this is a woefully incomplete list of people who are on the team, who have contributed, been lurking around. Um, who is on this and is here? Can they raise their hands? Can they now stand up? And can we all give them a big round of applause? Uh, 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 uh. You don't mind over there. Are you not on? <laughs> Let me just edit. Oh, <laughs> dear, dear. Okay. So, um, just the, if people don't know anything, anything about me, I'm a freelance engineer, DD since 2008. First bit of code in Etch, I think. Um, joined Reproducible Builds in January 2015 after I found it sort of a little offensive that a package that I was building. This didn't have the same MD5 when I rebuilt it. It was just awful. Um, FTP Assistant for the second time. I do QA. I run a few services. Travis, blah, blah, blah. I do the regular packaging. Uh, previously, did Debian Live work, DI work, um, that IRC bot that's a bit annoying, um, packages org, timeline, et cetera, et cetera. So just a bit of blah about me if you uh, you know. So a bit of a history lesson. I guess everyone knows who this chap is, um, or at least his beard. So he had the four freedoms. Um, let's immediately ignore, what, do you, what would you say, the numbers two and three, zero index. So for him to study how the program works, OK, it's pretty useful. And for him to run the program. But what is the program? Like To run the program is a little bit odd. Um, and um, particularly when you, oh, you can't see that, but basically that's a, um, App to get install of, I think Apache or something. But what what is the program? So, free software allows you to analyze the source code for malicious flaws. But as most distributions provide binaries for you, like where do these binaries come from? I mean, you you install something that has a million dependencies and things like that. And so, can you really trust that they're producing? binaries that you really want to run in your system? Do they really even match that source code that you've checked every single line of, like cough, cough, um, et cetera, et cetera? So reproducible builds is a way of solving that problem. And we do that by ensuring that compilation, repeated compilation, et cetera, will always produce the same result, whether you do it today, tomorrow, on whatever architecture, et cetera. And then multiple people will compare the results and um, the idea is that any attacker would have to infect, blackmail, et cetera, everyone simultaneously to get the new uh, checksum, et cetera. Um, because if someone uh, infected my, just my computer, my uploads, et cetera, and my builds would have a different um, SHA-1 or whatever you want to do. And so basically everything is bit for bit identical between builds. So that, that's what we do for builds is in sort of nutshell. Um, for more information, there's a really good talk here, um, which is available on the CCC website. Um, it's, it looks a little old, but it's still extremely relevant. Um, it has a lot of really interesting examples, uh, really concrete ones as well, um, especially a really cute Linux kernel-based <coughs> hack, which is definitely worth checking out. Um, there are some uh, technical, so sorry, some technical reasons for. Yes, so there's some technical advantages of reproducible builds as well. So you can um, look at your corrupted build environment. Maybe you've accidentally installed something into your cheroot, essentially. Uh, things that access the internet are uh, not very good anyway, because they leak privacy. Uh, general non-determinism in your thing isn't very good. The whole Martin Fowler idea of uh, unit tests should be reproducible. Uh, sorry, deterministic. Um, the embedded folks really like to sort of be, be able to go back in time, as they call it, so they can just check out an old version from Git, rebuild it, and uh, 
it it shows them that their build system is just kind of working and things like that. And it's actually just easier to test changes. So if you, I make it up, you're writing a Python package and, um, and you want to hack on DH Python, you can just see whether your change actually makes any difference whatsoever to the package. Currently, if you rebuild, the shell will be different. And so you're like, oh, well, did, did, did my change break anything? Did it just change the things I wanted? You don't know. So yeah, a lot of advantages there. Um, so this getting onto Debian, um, what have we got to in Debian? Um, testing is now over 90% reproducible on AMD64, which I think is not bad, not bad. <laughs> no? okay. um, excuse me? Only a few thousand packages to go. Yes, only a few thousand, yeah. And people keep uploading more. <laughs> so it's just, well, hopefully not, because they're sitting here. Um, and unstable is 88%. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. So we have three more block. Unfortunately, this is um, just showing the sort of prospects because um, if you do this in regular old SIDs that you're running on your laptops, um, it's 0% uh, because you need a few patches from our archive, our the reproducible builds, sort of custom archive. And these are the three. The, um, they're, they're all in D package, signed to at least, but uh, they, um, they have different dependencies and blockings. So for the actual status of these, I recommend looking at the bug numbers themselves um, because it's moving pretty fast. And they obviously would love some help if you, can, um, you, know, if you, can, if you think you can help on any of these bugs. That would be great. Um, once these land, you will be able to have a normal SID distribution on your laptop and your packages will build reproducibly if they are reproducible, of course. And that is the real goal. And I think, I think that's really important because then this turns from some sort of side project where you need like our custom devs. I mean, who's going to, are you really going to use our D package on your, um, on your regular system? Mm. I, I certainly don't and I'm in the project. So yeah. So once these land, I think those 90% will go up pretty high and quite quickly after that. So, yeah. so what else have we done? We agreed on a fixed build path. This is a problem where um, uh, binaries, et cetera, encode that they've been built in, for example, temp build B. Um, and, and, but as the Debian builds, build Bs don't specify that. We basically said that to be reproducible, we'll need a fixed build path. We also um, defined our, how our dot build info, which is a way of recording the environment used, um, to build a package is being um, saved alongside a build. And so it can be reproduced later because to uh, build a package reproducibly, you not only need the same source, you need to know, you know which dependencies were used to actually build that library and things like that. We've also been sending a whole bunch of patches, um, one in particular um, to upstream GCC to, um, to make sure that the underscore date and underscore time um, macros are reproducible in a way that I'll go into in a second. Um, we could spend the next 10 years patching them out of software, but we thought, no, we'll just, we'll just kind of fix them, uh, fix them in one place. So. We've also been working on tools. Um, Diffoscope, our um, diff, um, our in-depth uh, differ. So what it will do is unpack a Instead of just doing a, a very simple uh, diff between two files, it'll say, oh, this file is actually a zip file. We'll unpack that. And if that, can, that zip file contains an ISO, we'll also unpack that. And then they'll get all the way down and do very detailed diffs. So it's extremely useful tool, not generally, but especially for reproducible builds. So it'll unpack a dev and go all the way to the bottom, as it were. DisorderFS was worked on last year as well and this year. It's a fused file system for returning uh, random uh, directory orderings, which makes things quite interesting when doing linking, etc. Uh, Reprotest was defined and work is being started. This is our tool that um, will enable developers to test whether their builds are reproducible on their own system without installing you know, multiple pbuilders, random scripts. You should just be able to do Reprotest name of a package uh, or point it towards a directory on your local machine, 
and it'll build it twice in, in, in various ways. And then it'll say, yeah, we, we think your package is easy. Strip non-determinism is our library helper utility that will strip out very common causes of um, non-determinism in things like JPEG files, um, zip metadata, and things like that. And that supports a whole bunch of file formats, and we're adding a lot more. And that's another source of work that we've been doing over the past year. We also have um, an online version of the Diffiscope tool, which I referenced. So you can upload two files, for example, two depths, and it will give you a, um, a pretty um, diff between the two files, unpacking them recursively and things like that. Um, we've also defined um, source date epoch, which is our environment variable for um, specifying the build date for and, and time for a particular build. <laughs> This is because a build date is not particularly useful and also makes packages unreproducible if they add that, for example, to documentation pages. Um, the, uh, the, if, as the date changes, the, the SHA would clearly be different between two different builds if you build them on different days. And it's also useful for random seeds. For example, the polygen man pages were random uh, because, you know, it's a cute piece of software. Um, they are still random, but it at least uses the number of seconds since, a lot, since the Unix epoch from the Debian changelog entry uh, to seed that random. So at least that the, um, the package now builds reproducibly, even though if you upload a new version of the package, it will have a different man page content. This is, these are very important, very important things to work on. Anyway, that, that spec's available there. Um, we also have been working a lot on our testing infrastructure. We are testing uh, three suites, three architectures, uh, a number of distributions, uh, not just Debian. Um, and uh, we also have um, an outreachy student working on um, improving the output web pages. So um, that's Valerie over there. It's great. And, our, um, and the, hard, the i386 and AD64 hardware is sponsored by Profit Bricks, and the ARM hardware is sponsored by Debian and Vagrant. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, just an example of the sort of variations that we run on our, on our um, tests. So, you know, we, the, that first column over there is what we run on our first build or A build, and the second build column there. So you know, we set a different user and things like that. Useful and interesting ones are changing the locale, which has some very, very weird effects, um, and things like that. Time zones, obviously interesting, particularly when it causes time zone libraries to break. <coughs> so you had one job, yeah. um, things like that. We're always thinking of more things to add to here. Um, these are a bit more work in progress. <coughs> For example, CPU type variations, that kind of depends on the hardware and things like that. And the file system and things like that. We'd like to vary a few more things in that direction. What is Disorder FS? Disorder FS is our Fuse file system that we overlay on top. And if you run it, if you do a reader, it will provide you with uh, hopefully random results instead of the file system order. As I understand it, X will, and the variants will genuinely give you back the files in the same order that you, you added them to a directory, whilst BTRFS, because it has a different internal structure, will give you sort of non-deterministic results. And this just is like, well, yeah, he's rand. You know, you're going to get them in any order. So to force you to add explicit short, um, sorts and things like that. Beyond Debian, we're certainly trying to expand this beyond Debian because this is a problem that A, all distributions have, that everyone's interested in, and things like that. So this is just a short list of projects and our, uh, distributions that are, um, are working on this. Uh, we also have huge projects like um, Tails and Tor, who are obviously, you know, clearly things like this. And to speak to the cross-distribution, we had a, a world summit, as we like to pretentiously call it, in Athens last year, uh, late last year, and we hope to have another one soon, where we had sort of cross-distribution -dist collaboration and you know, sharing of tools, sharing of ideas, and things like that. And that was great to see um, other people's uh, sort of angles and things like that, and what, 
why other projects care about reproducibility. Because we, Debian has some sort of, we want it for these kind of reasons, but other people want them for other more technical reasons and things like that. Which is great to know. Um, there are also um, projects that you wouldn't necessarily think cared about it at all. Homebrew, the Apple, um, uh, what don't you call it package manager, I suppose. The, um, yeah, I hear some laughs. And the, um, they're also interested in reproducible builds as well. So it's not just hardcore technical people, or whatever you want to call it. Um, to speak to that even further, we removed, we used to use uh, reproducible.debian.net. Uh, and now we switch to this more uh, distribution agnostic L, and we try and run everything under that. So our tests are now being run on tests.reproducible.org instead of under Debian name. So whilst uh, there's a lot of Debian folks in it, it's, it's distribution agnostic and things like that. Um, so getting involved yourself. So obviously check your own packages and um, fix your own packages if you have unreproducible ones. Um, on that, I have a spare DevConf t-shirt. So the first person to apply a patch and upload it and close a reproducible bug or fix their package, if you mail me, the first person gets it. So yeah, just throwing that out there. Uh, I hear they're in demand. Um, stop using dates if you're an upstream. So if you're using, you know, just getting the current date, stop, using, stop doing that. Use our um, source date epoch. See the spec for more details or examples. Visit our website, um, things like that. Or and, and certainly stop by the uh, IRC channel because that would be the best way to work out how you can sort of get involved and, um, and sort of you know, see what interests you and things like that. Uh, we have, there's all sorts of, sort of technical things you could be working on all, and loads of documentation. We have an idea to... Uh, we certainly need some documentation for that build info file that I mentioned earlier. So that's one thing. So don't feel that this is a too technical for you or in, in that kind of angle. Uh, so yeah, I did really left a lot of time for questions. So um, fire away. <coughs> Firstly, thank you. Thank you to everyone who's involved in reproducible builds. I think this is an amazing piece of work. I think it's very important as someone who has built commercial products on top of Linux, on top of Debian in the past, the ability to, to know I can reproduce everything just from Git, fantastic in both personally from a security point of view and from a commercial point of view. Great. How can we make this happen for Stretch? You say it's, it's, it's all patches that are yours. There's three in the package. <coughs> If we get those three package, patches in the D package, are, are we good for stretch? Is that happening? Is it something we in the room can do to help? I mean, I mean it would be lovely to have a release where we actually had reproducible builds in mainline Debian. How, how do we make that happen that sooner happen, rather yeah. than later? So whether, um, I suppose there's, we can split that into two immediately. Do we have those packages landed and you can build reproducible packages in stretch? That'd be great shall we try and make stretch reproducible it in itself um, is, a little, is obviously harder. It, for example, will require us to rebuild the archive a day before the release, which um, is fun on architectures that don't build in uh, 24 hours. Hmm. What's the best way? Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, landing those packages is probably, uh, those patches is probably the best way forward. Um, and then we'll sort of have to see where we are in terms of <coughs> the release. It's not something I can really speak to because I haven't really been thinking about that. I mean, I'm presumably you, you, you would like Stretch to be reproducible. I, mean, I think um, Stretch fully reproducible would be absolutely fantastic. But even if we got it to the point that you could do reproducible builds of your own packages. So some packages are reproducible and the infrastructure was in stretch so that the subsequent release would be fully reproducible as a release goal. I think it would be ideal. If you could achieve stretch reproducible with our help, fantastic, but really it's the tools. Can we get all of the tool pieces in so that if I have my own package in stretch, 
I can be sure, I can make it reproducible and worry about my piece of the puzzle. Yes, well, I would love that to happen. And yeah, it's just a case of time, stroke manpower. And, and is that just the depackaged package? Is, is there anything on those three bugs you listed on that screen that we need to worry about getting into Stretch to have the infrastructure in the distro proper? I don't. Um, yes, there's another thing for DAC, but I think that's covered under one of those bugs to support the build-in profiles, for example. Um, and then, yes. Sorry? Build these. I, I guess this would also mean throwing away uploaded binary packages. And that's, is, that a, uh, is that a requirement? I, I would assume so, yes. That For what reason? The, because to some degree, I don't think the build environment of all the DDs are set up reproducible, even when the tools are there, because there are different approaches how to build a package, like car builder, S build, PD build. Um, sorry, what was that? I mean, if you upload a binary of something where the build is reproducible, then, I mean, it's either reproducible or it's not. And if it's reproducible, I don't really care where the binary that was, that's in the archive came exactly, from. Exactly, yes, but, but is that a blocker? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. I don't think that we would necessarily have to do wholesale removal of binaries during upload for that reason. There's other good reasons that we've thought about in the past to want to have the auto builder network build all the binaries that are in the distro. But exactly, yeah. it's occurred to me a couple of times that if in fact we get to the point where all the binary packages are reproducible, whether it was built on my laptop or your laptop or an auto builder, it doesn't really matter if it's reproducible. Completely agree. And these are my kind of sort of cherry on the top things. For example, you could have not only throw away binaries, but if you upload something it doesn't matter it's not reproducible, then it just gets, gets automatically discarded, things like that. Um, yes, I would love all those things. Um, I'm keeping my, um, keeping my focus on, on the shorter term. Uh, yeah. yeah, something like that. So um, I, I, I've been paying close attention, or not, not close enough attention, but some attention to reproducible builds uh, from the use case that I have, which is actually very different from the use case. I just was reviewing a website of all the participants in the reproducibuildbuilds.org. Uh, they all have a very different use case than I have. Um, most people in the room know I do a good amount of GPL enforcement as part of my living. Um, I often worry about a problem that I would call reproducible builds, but I have a Wally opponent meaning that they don't want me to reproduce their binary. Uh, they don't care if I can. And, uh, and I'm fighting with them to try to prove to them that the source code they gave me doesn't actually reproduce their binary when they claim that it does. Um, maybe you run into that, I don't know. But, but I think mostly you have people cooperating with you. You've already done, first of all, I want to thank you. You've already done some tools that will immediately help GPL enforcement. I didn't know about Diffoscope until just now. Mm. Um, that will be a, that tool itself is going to be a huge help to GPL enforcement. So thank you for writing it. It will be a big help to us. Um, but I also wanted to ask you if you had any thoughts about how to take reproducible bills in that Wally opponent area where they're trying to basically trick you and you need to test the source to see if it's all really there. Have you done any work in thinking about that area? And do you think that's appropriate to be part of the reproducible builds community? We haven't done much thinking about the area. I mean, some of it is sort of, by the Wiley opponent, just to clarify, do you mean that they're, they're changing the source code? violating the GPL, they claim they're not. I'm saying there is source that's supposed to be here that's not. I can prove it to you because I can't reproduce the build and we have a fight about it. So I, I need see. the yeah. technical facts to back that up. And re uh, using a reproducible build process and showing that it doesn't work is, an, uh, is one technical fact that I can use to back that up. And we, we actually do that. We do it all by hand, right? We have a human that tries to build the source code release they give it and we send them a giant report saying the source code doesn't match the binaries you distributed. Here's the hundred reasons why. Yeah. Uh, I would love to do more and more of that in an automated process. It would probably always need human intelligence, but the less human intelligence, the better, because humans are much more expensive than computers. Nice. Well, I, haven't, I literally had never thought of that use case, and it sounds really valuable. So no, I, I personally haven't, uh, 
How does that? But uh, yes, I, I feel like it would certainly be part of that that the community. Yeah. And if the if this description of uh, of the uh, diffoscope impressed you, you should really look at the tool. I think it can be enhanced with very very little bits of extra with the insight you you see uh, you see uh, gave with this use case. For example, it, uh, on finding bits of a binary that uh, that are clearly copied or carried from other places, like having as part of the diffoscope output the SHA of uh, of whatever blobs it contains, uh, it can really enhance this uh, this uh, its work. Mm -hmm. Uh, to speak to your first comment, actually, the, um, about upstreams, uh, were you talking about whether upstreams are amenable to changes, or was that a different? I was just talking about GPM virus. You were talking about GPM virus. They're my upstreams. <laughs> they are upstreams, yes. Thank you. Hi. Uh, one more question. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your talk and for your work. Uh, my you. question is actually, um, is uh, Linux itself reproducible, like the kernel? And secondly, apart from potentially Linux, um, are there any packages which are not yet reproducible and look like they're really tricky and no one knows why? Or could you tell us a little bit about that? Thank you. OK, so on, on Linux itself, and by that I mean the, the source package called Linux inside Debian, uh, Ben Hutchings did a lot of work making that reproducible and working with Upstream. Um, so special thanks to him. Um, I, it certainly was at one point, and I think it remains reproducible. Um, someone should, could probably check that quite quickly. But if not, it's going to be very small things. But yeah, Linux itself <coughs> is, is reproducible, et cetera, which I think is great. Um, and your second point was on? Uh, oh, particular packages, yeah. Well, the, the big one was making the GCC underscore macro support it. And that was uh, not necessarily a technical thing, but more of a just getting it in the GCC release cycle. We maintain a large, what well, happens to be a large YAML file of, cat and we categorize all the particular issues. And um, so it'd be quite easy, sorry, it's straightforward to see which packages we haven't worked out a reason for. Um, for example, there are you know, 200 packages affected by a Sphinx, the documentation generator. Um, and so we tag them together. So we're like, OK, we, we know these are unreproducible, but it's for reason X. And so we can concentrate on the ones that we don't know the reason of. Um, we have added notes to particularly weird ones. Um, but we don't have a, a sort of priority order list of um, these packages are particularly weird and we don't understand. Yeah. Um, things like that. So, so it's not a case of, it's, it's not going to be a case of the last 10% requiring like another 100% of the time sort of situation? Well, it might be. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a sort of really nasty, not 80-20 principle there, but uh, you know, 95 bar, yeah. Thank you. No problem. And of course, we can keep add, as we keep adding more variations to the previous list, we make our jobs harder, in a sense. Um, so. so I will just relay uh, Guillaume's uh, comments on IRC, he said, um, hey, the SID is already reprodu reproducible from the PKJ point of view. Um, the hash in the status patch is a non-blocker. The control tire permission patch is only required if you build with a different U-mask. And the build info is required to be able to build the same package over a period of time on a different setup. If you build right now twice in a row, you should, it should give you the same result as of the PKJ 1.18.8. Smiley. Brilliant. <laughs> well, thanks to Guillaume. Um, oh, but I, st yeah. I still had a question. Um, currently, you build the same package <coughs> twice with different, uh, in different environments. But do you compare any of these two builds with what we have in the archive or not at all? We currently don't. Um, we probably could. Uh, we, we just don't have that. We just haven't done that kind of thing. We're also not comparing between the two architectures at the moment. Or, sorry, three architectures. Um, we care. We currently, it's only really visible if, um, for example, the i386 ones are reproducible within themselves. The, for example, our architecture independent packages, which should really be the same across, depending on, it shouldn't make any difference what architecture you build them on. Uh, I believe Vagrant was thinking of working on that. 
Yeah. Oh, he's just uh, Well, uh, actually, what caused me to set up the ARMHF build network was one of my packages, uh, U-Boot, uh, built reproducibly on AMD64, but I knew that it was impossible for it to boot reproducibly on ARM because it built different targets. So there are some packages in the archive that actually build different packages on different architectures. So um, one idea I was having was to build Arch all packages on different architectures and compare them, but that's a longer term goal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, what I meant before with respect to that the uploaded binary files should get sort of thrown away. Um, somehow the archive needs to check. I mean, we can put trust into the developers that they're building in an environment that produces reproducible binaries, but we should sort of check that. Yes. And at that point, uh, if we build it reproducible for checking if, if, if it's the same, then we can throw away the uploaded binary directly and take the one from the check. Yes, good point. Yeah. Uh, this is all amazing, and my question, so I have a package that used to be reproducible, but then I allowed it to become irreproducible. Ah. Uh, very embarrassing. And so, so I have a question, which is, oh, Lambie, oh when will you be providing me a deput target where I can deput my upload, my dot upload to, along with uh, array source chart, TGZ, and everything else, XE, uh, so that it only gets actually uploaded FTP master if it is reproducible. And then your, de your deput target can just reject my garbage. Great question. Um, so our, our attack for that was to, to uh, was the, actually the repro test tool, so you can you test it locally first. That but I'm not going to. In, I'm too lazy. I know. I just and want to think other, of deput yeah. too. Um, it, it's just a question of manpower. We'd love all, we'd love to add that to um, uh, to DAC, etc., and things like that. Uh, well, but can I add it? Would you and would you accept a contribution to add a, that sort of thing to your existing Jenkins setup? So it'll so. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I could deput yeah. to your Jenkins, and then it'll run it through your Blender and then it'll upload it. Well, certainly, I accept that, yeah. Because that, cause that's perfect, because that'll save you an upload and, you know, you know, having a Debian revision of dash 17 to try and get, oh, I'll try again to get reproducible, oh, I'll try again to get reproducible. Um, yeah, absolutely, we'd certainly accept that, yeah. Um, oh, and the, um, you can also subscribe to uh, notifications, so you can get an email to say when your package was previously reproducible and now isn't. So you can get, you can get that sort of state trigger change. Have uh, discussions been started with the release team to have that into Britney somehow so that reproducibility regressions actually block migration or is that for the next release cycle? Um, that would probably be for the next release cycle, I guess. Um, um, perhaps micro? You. I would opt into this kind of aggressive thing for my packages. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, we were speaking to the release team mostly in the context of uh, Stretch become reproducible. And uh, we'd have to probably speak to them for Stretch plus one on the question of whether that becomes a, a Britney blocker, et cetera, a uh, transition blocker. So. But I do like the idea. Any further questions? No, one well, here. Yeah. Have you noticed any packages that have been trojaned or backdoored? Or have we noticed any? No, unfortunately not in a weird sense, because that would be a sort of quite a good um, publicity coup. We have found a whole bunch of broken packages that are just horrendous. <laughs> and we have no idea why they've even worked up to now. Like, it's just been through. Um, some of them are quite fantastic. Um, but no, we haven't found any uh, malicious attempts. Um, yeah.
What's the weirdest thing that you've seen while this doing this stuff? Oh. Well, the weirdest fix I think was required for DH Python was where if a package built too quickly, it would result in the shebang lines in packages in user bin non-deterministically being set to use to Python 2 or Python 3.5. <laughs> Just what? Um, <laughs> like, yeah. And it was, was because, well, I've already sort of perhaps given the game away with it built too quickly because it meant that the M time was under a second and it was using second resolution and it didn't think that something had updated, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, all sorts of, all sorts of wins, yeah. You could also test on really fast machines and really slow machines. Uh, testing on fast and slow machines, yeah, yeah. Or, or ARM, uh, yes. <laughs> Oh, there are, there are some goodies. I'll have to, I'll have to think of them and get back to you on that one. Yeah. OK, great. Oh, we have another question. There was some concerns that I heard about that uh, building reproducible might open a new kind of attack patterns, because all distributions now probably, after reproducible deployed everywhere, um, have exactly the same packages the same binaries, and through that stack attack patterns might work more universal than they are now, which are might be specific to a certain distribution. So I'm not sure I follow. So um, there was some security concerns with respect to that there might be new attack patterns uh, with respect to reproducible builds because the same binary is used on all the distributions and not just within Debian, within Red Hat, Fedora, they have their own binaries, so to say. And how is that? Which uh, have attack different pattern? patterns. The monocoque concern. Mm. Use GR security. Is that the? Is that the? It's not something I've I've really thought much about. Sorry, go ahead, Stephen. Actually, the GR security package in Debian has the exact same problem under described. Um, if you randomly build GR security yourself, it puts some entropy into a header, which changes the order of kernel data structures. So you're actually safer from building a non-deterministic binary than to use a distribution provided one. Right. But this is really a sort of edge case and generally reproducible builds fixes so many other security flaws that are far more important to fix right now. Yes. You know, and you're, you're right that there are other um, sort of uses for non-determinism. For example, um, profile guide optimization it's pretty random and things like that. So, uh, because it's based on test timings. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that one. That's, that's quite interesting. So I just wanted to observe that it, it's obvious to me that the work on reproducibility is following in the footsteps of a lot of other similar-ish initiatives we've tackled over the years, whether it was uh, cross-architecture portability or, or you know, dealing with 64-bit isms or whatever. It seems like every time we find something to focus on in the distribution, we end up generally improving the quality of the software because we end up finding and chasing down all of these sort of weird behavioral corner cases where someone was either too clever or too lazy in the development of the, the software or its build harnessing. And I just, I, I can't tell you how excited I am every time I hear about, you know, progress here because it's another example of a, of a place where I think uh, Debian generally is sort of leading and helping to drive you know, making the, the free software world a, a better, more robust, safer place. And it's just mm -hmm. really cool. So thanks again for me and all the folks around. Oh, thank you. So um, I wanted to rely a message on ISC that different distros still use different version combinations. So they will be different. And um, my own comment to the GRSEC uh, randomization is the fact that you could put a deterministic 
pattern in there doesn't mean you have to. It just means you can verify that if you use the same pattern, you get the same binary. Um, if you were to place a bet on a date um, to have net inst be fully reproducible, when would that be? Um, <laughs> so that becomes problematic because that requires maintainer scripts to be um, deterministic, which is also the same problem for making reproducible to bootstrap, for example, uh, etc. And that's a different problem. Uh, I mean, it's technically not reproducible build, but if you squint, but yeah, I know it's the same. It's the same same issue. In terms of a date, I mean, five years, because it. Oh. Mm, it. I've looked at a few post-ins. Thank you. Uh, I've looked at a few post-ins, and a lot of them are, are just not reproducible and things like that. Uh, so yeah, it, it's a really hard one. Well, the network installer is basically kernel plus some static scripts plus a, plus a bunch of packages. Did you just use the word just there? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I do have a, a branch with a reproducible to bootstrap, um, but it's really ugly. And I, it seems just that would be hard in itself. Um, and so as soon as you start doing other stuff, it becomes. Well, maybe we didn't understand each other's. What oh, okay. I meant was not having the first run of NetInst be reproducible. What I meant was having NetInst actually the image that is most downloaded to, to get Debian. Well, well, there's not that many packages in NetInst itself. It's, it's more like it's, it's an ISO or something that you put on a USB K. But that is the first thing people, everyone downloads as being Debian. And that, that might be the first goal to have reproducible so that anyone in the world can say, when, when I take this entry point for Debian, well, I can know that is really what they mean. What oh, so you mean. mean, yeah, sorry for misunderstanding. Um, I don't know. I haven't, um, I haven't done any sort of poking in that direction. It's not something that's been worked on, so it may be sort of a big, big can of worms. Um, yeah, it, it intrigues me, Oliver. It seems like if you had the um, UDEBs being reproducible, then what you'd need on top of that is just the, the DI scripts being reproducible. Mm. I say just as someone who hasn't recently hacked on DI, but you know, it, it, it's simpler than having your root file system be reproducible all the time. Yes. So it's a yeah. halfway house. That, that's probably the, the best first step, I think, yeah. Um, Immediately thinking that's to be difficult to test, because, but yeah. Hmm. I'll take that. You just give me one year. One year. One year. Okay. Instead See of you five. In Montreal. <laughs> I volunteer. You'll get more than a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. Working on the T-shirt. No. I think we're uh, we're in time to to close the, the this session. There's time for many more questions outside of this room. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, team.